only one, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Jonathan and I bring you stories along with John Russell. Alice Bryant answers a new question from a learner in this week's Ask a Teacher. We close our show with an American story. This week, it is a white heron. But first, here's Jonathan. As Taliban militants gained control of Afghanistan's second and third largest cities on Friday, the United States and Western nations are preparing to send troops to help evacuate workers from embassies in the capital, Kabul. The capture of Kandahar in the south and Herat in the west, after days of clashes, is a major loss for the Afghan government. The Taliban also captured the towns of Lashkar Gah in the south and Kuala Ina in the northwest, security officers said. Ghulam Habib Hashimi, a council member, told Reuters by telephone from Herat, the city looks like a front line, a ghost town. Families have either left or are hiding in their homes. In Kandahar, the birthplace of the Taliban, witnesses said the militants seized the governor's office and other buildings. An official said government forces still controlled Kandahar's airport, which was the U.S. military's second biggest base in Afghanistan. Since August 6th, the militants have taken control of 14 of Afghanistan's 34 provincial capitals. Of Afghanistan's major cities, the government still holds Kabul, Mazari Sharif in the north, and Jalalabad near the Pakistani border in the east. The defeats have raised concerns that the U.S.-supported government could fall to the militants as international forces complete their withdrawal after 20 years of war. And U.S. intelligence reports said this week that the Taliban could isolate Kabul within 30 days and take it over in 90 days. On Thursday... U.S. defense officials announced that 3,000 extra troops would be deployed to Afghanistan within 48 hours to help evacuate U.S. embassy workers. Britain said it would send about 600 troops to help its citizens leave. The Associated Press reported Canada would also deploy special forces troops to Kabul, to help in the evacuation of embassy workers. Other embassies and aid groups said they were also getting their people out. The speed of the Taliban offensive has raised criticism of U.S. President Joe Biden's decision to withdraw American troops, 20 years after they ousted the Taliban following the September 11th attacks on the U.S., Biden said this week he did not regret his decision. He noted that the U.S. has spent more than $1 trillion in America's longest war and has lost thousands of troops. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin spoke to President Ashraf Ghani on Thursday. They told him the United States remained invested in Afghanistan's security and stability and is working in support of a political solution. (music) 
Going to the movies is not always a fun experience for people who cannot hear. Film showings in theaters with captions, the written words the actors are saying, are limited, and the special equipment needed to read the captions is often broken or unavailable. A new movie aims to change that. Coda is a coming-of-age story about the only hearing member of a deaf family. It opens in theaters Friday. The film will be shown with captions that require no special equipment to see. Marley Matlin plays a deaf mother in the film. She is the only deaf performer to ever win an Oscar, which she won for her work in Children of a Lesser God in 1987. Matlin said of Coda, It couldn't be more groundbreaking. In other words, the film is introducing new ideas and ways of filmmaking to the world. Coda won four awards at the Sundance Film Festival earlier this year. Along with playing in theaters across the United States and Britain, Coda also will be available with full subtitles in more than 36 languages on Apple TV Plus starting Friday. Apple worked with movie theater operators to make sure the film would be played with captions for all moviegoers. This kind of captioning is known as open captions. Experts believe it is the first film released in theaters to offer open captions. It is historic. It is huge for all of us, said Daniel Durant, a deaf actor who plays son Leo in the film. This is a day we have waited to see for so many years, he added. The letters in the film's name, CODA, stand for Children of Deaf Adults. The film tells the story of a high school student named Ruby. She has grown up having to interpret for her deaf father, mother, and brother. The family communicates with sign language. All three of the deaf characters in the film are played by deaf actors. Durant said that while some parts of the movie are from the position of deaf people, the appeal of CODA is universal. Anyone who watches this can feel connected with it because everyone comes from a family and every family goes through similar struggles. Kids growing up, what they are going to do in their future, becoming independent, maybe they're moving away from their family, Durant said. Writer-director Sean Hader, who can hear, learned American Sign Language for the project. He wanted to be sure CODA was available for everyone to watch and enjoy. Filmmakers behind the project hope the open captions that appear in CODA will lead others in the movie industry to follow their example. They also hope it will urge deaf people to try movie theaters again. A man's days living alone in the forest in the state of New Hampshire appear to be over. David Lidstone said he does not think he can return to his old way of living. The decision came after the cabin he lived in burned down not long ago. Lidstone is also known as River Dave. He had been living for twenty-seven years in the area, but was ordered to leave in a recent court case. In a discussion with the Associated Press, Lidstone used the term hermit, a person who lives in a simple way apart from others, to describe how he used to live. I don't see how I can go back to being a hermit 
because society is not going to allow it, Lidstone, age 81, said. Lidstone cut his firewood and grew his food in the woods along the Merrimack River in the town of Canterbury. He built the cabin with his wife, from whom he is now separated, although he said they are still married. He said he is not too sad about the loss of his life in isolation. Maybe the things I've been trying to avoid are the things that I really need in life, said Lidstone, who is not close with his family. Lidstone did not want to say anything more about his family. Two of his three sons had told the AP that they had not been in touch with their father recently. His daughter did not respond to a message asking for a comment. On July 15th, Lidstone was jailed and told he would be released if he agreed to leave the cabin. The action followed a land dispute that goes back to 2016. The landowner, 86-year-old Leonard Giles, of South Burlington, Vermont, wanted Lidstone off his land. The land is undeveloped and mostly used for woodcutting. It has been owned by the same family since 1963. Lidstone had said an earlier owner in the family gave his word years ago that he could live there. But Lidstone had no written agreement. He later disputed that he was even on the land owned by the family. In a recent court case, both sides agreed to allow Lidstone to collect his cats and chickens and remaining possessions. Some items had been given to police to keep safe. Lidstone, who still believes he was not on Giles' land, also was given permission to hire a surveyor to give him peace of mind, Judge Andrew Shulman said. A fire destroyed the cabin on August 4th. The fire happened hours after Lidstone defended himself during a court hearing. He was released from jail the next day, after the judge ruled that he would have less reason to return to this particular place in the woods. Meanwhile, many people across the United States and in other countries have offered to help Lidstone. They have offered to help raise money, or offered him a place to live. Lidstone said he is thankful for all the support. He is still trying to decide where he will go next. He would not mind staying in New Hampshire, where he has developed some strong connections. I'm John Russell. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from Arslan in Kashmir. He asks, Is it correct to use may and will in a single sentence, like in, Maybe it will rain today? The word may suggests a possibility, while will shows certainty. Thank you. Hello, Arslan. This is a good question. Here is the answer. The word maybe is an adverb that means possibly but not definitely. It expresses that an action has a chance of happening in the future. As in your example, maybe it will rain today. May and maybe are closely connected but they are different parts of speech. The word may is a modal verb. Will is also a modal verb. 
It expresses that something is expected to happen in the future. You were right to question the use of two modal verbs together. For example, you would not want to say, It may will rain today. But again, maybe is an adverb, not a modal. So saying maybe it will rain today is totally acceptable. Another example that uses both maybe and will is maybe my friends will visit. Keep in mind that using the modal may or might is a more common way to express these kinds of possibilities. For instance, you can say, it may rain today, or my friends might visit. And lastly, there is another meaning of will that does express certainty. For example, if I say, you will really enjoy this lesson, it shows that I feel sure of it. And that's Ask a Teacher for this week. I'm Alice Bryant. The forest was full of shadows as a little girl hurried through it one summer evening in June. It was already eight o'clock and Sylvie wondered if her grandmother would be angry with her for being so late. Every evening, Sylvie left her grandmother's house at 5.30 to bring their cow home. The old animals spent her days out in the open country eating sweet grass. It was Sylvie's job to bring her home to be milked. When the cow heard Sylvie's voice calling her, she would hide among the bushes. This evening, it had taken Sylvie longer than usual to find her cow. The child hurried the cow through the dark forest, following a narrow path that led to her grandmother's home. The cow stopped at a small stream to drink. As Sylvie waited, she put her bare feet in the cold, fresh water of the stream. She had never before been alone in the forest as late as this. The air was soft and sweet. Sylvie felt as if she were a part of the gray shadows and silver leaves that moved in the evening breeze. She began thinking how it was only a year ago that she came to her grandmother's farm. Before that, she had lived with her mother and father in a dirty, crowded factory town. One day, Sylvie's grandmother had visited them and had chosen Sylvie from all her brothers and sisters to be the one to help her on her farm in Vermont. The cow finished drinking, and as the nine-year-old child hurried through the forest to the home she loved, she thought again about the noisy town where her parents still lived. Suddenly, the air was cut by a sharp whistle not far away. Sylvie knew it wasn't a friendly bird's whistle. It was the determined whistle of a person. She forgot the cow and hid in some bushes. But she was too late. Hello, little girl, a young man called out cheerfully. How far is it to the main road? Sylvie was trembling as she whispered, Two miles. She came out of the bushes and looked up into the face of a tall young man carrying a gun. The stranger began walking with Sylvie as she followed her cow through the forest. I've been hunting for birds, he explained, but I've lost my way. 
Do you think I can spend the night at your house? Sylvie didn't answer. She was glad they were almost home. She could see her grandmother standing near the door of the farmhouse. When they reached her, the stranger put down his gun and explained his problem to Sylvie's smiling grandmother. Of course you can stay with us, she said. We don't have much, but you're welcome to share what we have. Now, Sylvie, get a plate for the gentleman. After eating, they all sat outside. The young man explained he was a scientist who collected birds. Do you put them in a cage? Sylvie asked. No, he answered slowly. I shoot them and stuff them with special chemicals to preserve them. I have over 100 different kinds of birds from all over the United States in my study at home. Sylvie knows a lot about birds, too, her grandmother said proudly. She knows the forest so well, the wild animals come and eat bread right out of her hands. So, Sylvie knows all about birds. Maybe she can help me then, the young man said. I saw a white heron not far from here two days ago. I've been looking for it ever since. It's a very rare bird, the little white heron. Have you seen it too? He asked Sylvie. But Sylvie was silent. You would know it if you saw it, he added. It's a tall, strange bird with soft white feathers and long, thin legs. It probably has its nest at the top of a tall tree. Sylvie's heart began to beat fast. She knew that strange white bird. She had seen it on the other side of the forest. The young man was staring at Sylvie. I would give ten dollars to the person who showed me where the white heron is. That night, Sylvie's dreams were full of all the wonderful things she and her grandmother could buy for ten dollars. Sylvie spent the next day in the forest with the young man. He told her a lot about the birds they saw. Sylvie would have had a much better time if the young man had left his gun at home. She could not understand why he killed the birds he seemed to like so much. She felt her heart tremble every time he shot an unsuspecting bird as it was singing in the trees. But Sylvie watched the young man with eyes full of admiration. She had never seen anyone so handsome and charming. A strange excitement filled her heart, a new feeling the little girl did not recognize. Love. At last evening came. They drove the cow home together. Long after the moon came out and the young man had fallen asleep, Sylvie was still awake. She had a plan that would get the ten dollars for her grandmother and make the young man happy. When it was almost time for the sun to rise, she quietly left her house and hurried through the forest. She finally reached a huge pine tree, so tall it could be seen for many miles around. Her plan was to climb to the top of the pine tree. She could see the whole forest from there. She was sure she would be able to see where the white heron had hidden its nest. 
Sylvie's bare feet and tiny fingers grab the tree's rough trunk. Sharp, dry branches scratched at her like cat's claws. The pine tree's sticky sap made her fingers feel stiff and clumsy as she climbed higher and higher. The pine tree seemed to grow taller the higher that Sylvie climbed. The sky began to brighten in the east. Sylvie's face was like a pale star when at last she reached the tree's highest branch. The golden sun's rays hit the green forest. Two hawks flew together in slow-moving circles far below Sylvie. Sylvie felt as if she could go flying among the clouds, too. To the west, she could see other farms and forests. Suddenly, Sylvie's dark gray eyes caught a flash of white that grew larger and larger. A bird with broad white wings and a long, slender neck flew past Sylvie and landed on a pine branch below her. The white heron smoothed its feathers and called to its mate, sitting on their nest in a nearby tree. Then it lifted its wings and flew away. Sylvie gave a long sigh. She knew the wild bird secret now. Slowly, she began her dangerous trip down the ancient pine tree. She did not dare to look down and tried to forget that her fingers hurt and her feet were bleeding. All she wanted to think about was what the stranger would say to her when she told him where to find the heron's nest. As Sylvie climbed slowly down the pine tree, the stranger was waking up back at the farm. He was smiling because he was sure from the way the shy little girl had looked at him that she had seen the white heron. About an hour later, Sylvie appeared. Both her grandmother and the young man stood up as she came into the kitchen. The splendid moment to speak about her secret had come. But Sylvie was silent. Her grandmother was angry with her. Where had she been? The young man's kind eyes looked deeply into Sylvie's own dark gray ones. He could give Sylvie and her grandmother ten dollars. He had promised to do this, and they needed the money. Besides, Sylvie wanted to make him happy. But Sylvie was silent. She remembered how the white heron came flying through the golden air and how they watched the sun rise together from the top of the world. Sylvie could not speak. She could not tell the heron's secret and give its life away. The young man went away disappointed later that day. Sylvie was sad. She wanted to be his friend. He never returned. But many nights, Sylvie heard the sound of his whistle as she came home with her grandmother's cow. Were the birds better friends than their hunter might have been? Who can know? And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.